So, what is your name? I am Robin Hansen. Robin Hansen, what do you do? I'm Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University. All right. In Fairfax, and, Virginia. All right. And uh, are we alone, Robin? Uh, I've got two cats staring through the window, but okay, pretty so much it. <laughs> okay. So, you, you answered the question, are we alone with, am I alone or are we alone in this property, in yeah. your house, right? So, but in Fairfax County, we're not alone, I guess. Not remotely, no. Okay, and on the earth, are we alone? No. And who's we? Well, we usually are focused on humans. So, we humans on earth. We humans. Have many other humans around us together as humans. Okay, so are we humans as a collective alone in the universe? Uh, well, we have many other animals on earth and even machine assistants, but uh, they don't really satisfy as, uh, as interaction partners. And as far as we know, we've never seen anyone else in the universe. So, if you're satisfied with your interaction partners on Earth, then we are not alone. And if you're dissatisfied with your partners on Earth, your, what did you say, the other, other organisms on Earth, then you, we are alone. Is that what you just said? Yeah. So, the, so whether the answer to the question, are we alone or not, depends on your satisfaction with your dog. Depends on what kind of partners you're looking for, exactly. Okay, what kind of partners are you looking for? Uh, well... If there were civilization as capable as humans out there somewhere, we'd be really interested. We'd also be interested in knowing if there were uh, bacteria or uh, even amoebas, but we're not nearly as interested. We are interested in something as capable as us. Capable. So let's what, tell me what this, about this word capable. Do you mean can smell as well as we can smell or yeah. better like a dog? I think it's more about our future potential. Humans have an enormously promising future potential. We look like we are not going to stay where we are and what we are. We are growing very rapidly. We've been doubling our economy every 15 years for the last century. We were doubling it every thousand years for a few thousand years before that. We are on a rampage growing. And if we keep going where we're going, uh, we're going to be far richer. We're going to be far more capable of technologies. We could leave this planet. We could go uh, explore. We could colonize. We could take over the universe, maybe. We have a lot of potential. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, if I were a bacteria in a petri dish, and we'd be, our population would be doubling and bubbling. And say, we're going to take over this petri dish, and yeah, then but you that, have a limit at the edge of the dish. Exactly. That's right. And so, so you don't see any limits then. There's more of a potential to escape the limits. We are at the moment limited, but we have this powerful ability to grow and improve technology. And it's not clear we have limits there. And when you say we, do you mean the first world? Or are you talking about we as a species or we as like Humanity a... Humanity as a whole has been growing powerfully for okay. a long time. So but not some of it's growing better, faster than others. Maybe even uh, some of it's more advanced than others. But still, mostly it's humanity collectively that's been growing really so, fast. And you don't care about other mammals. You're not talking about chimpanzees and orangutans here, Yeah, right? the rest of the mammals haven't really contributed that much to human growth. <laughs> human growth but the, okay so to, to our civilizations growth. so so yeah during the farming era, the domestication of plants and animals was an essential part of growth so part of growing uh, thousands of years ago was slowly accumulating more kinds of plants and animals that were integrated into our ecology and economy and that was important but today they're really not contributing that much to them. okay so you think humans because we have big brains are have a lot of capability is that why that's one of the most uh, important questions we have. What is it that makes us distinct? What makes humans more capable than all the other animals we've seen? The standard explanation, as far as I understand it, was cultural evolution. We found a way to share innovations without sharing genes. Pretty much all other animals, uh, in order to have an innovation and then share it and spread it, they had to embody it in their genes. They had to genetically encode new strategies and ways of doing things. That takes a long time. It's slow and expensive. Having language and culture so that we can just watch what other people do, copy what they do, and then share that with other people, that's enormously powerful. It means we can much more quickly develop and share innovations. But computers are much quicker than people at exchanging information, right? You and I are exchanging a couple of bits per second, and no. a computer's like billions of bits, <laughs> mil computers millions of bits. are a pretty recent thing. So until recently, we were the only one around who could do that sort of thing. Okay, so if you're, but you're measuring things about, you, what you just said about humans, you could say it even more about computers, say the computers are the capable ones, not us, and so we could be left in the, in the background by computers. Well, there is a good risk that over the longer run, we will be left in the background by computers, yes. But so they're going to kill the us, moment, they aren't. like in the Matrix, they're going to kill us and take over the world and use us as batteries or something? Uh, well, I actually, I have this book here. Okay. The Age what of the, M. The Age of What's the Work, M Love, book? and Life When Robots Rule the Earth. M when is short robots for rule the Earth. Yeah. So it's short for emulation. Emulation. And it's about 
our descendants being robots, but very much like us. So an emulation is where you take a real human brain, you scan it in fine spatial and chemical detail, and then you make a computer model that has all of the same connections and cell types all modeled on the computer. And if you have good enough models and a good enough scan, then the input-output behavior of your model should be close enough to the input-output behavior of the original brain that it would act the same in the same situation. Wait, let's, you, let's stop there now. Is this a destructive scan we're talking about? Initially, it would probably be destructive. Initially, yes. you're going to have a destructive scan. So are you going to volunteer for this? I might well, yeah. Once it works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So who are you going to try it on? I guess a couple of dogs. You'll try it on animals first. Sure. Other animals. Okay. Now, are you an animal? Of course. Okay. So you're going to. You said you're going to try it on animals. Other so you're animals. An, other animals. Other okay, non-human animals. <laughs> yeah. Chimpanzees, for example. Uh huh. Okay. Mice, now, rabbits. That. Sort so of. the idea is to simulate your. Now, the the idea of simulating your brain and kind of downloading it onto something is kind of weird because it reminds me of a, the Cartesian duality between mind and body, and I've always thought. That's crazy. The mind and the body are so intricately connected, you can't distinguish them all. So, but then, then I'd say, well, okay, so do the mind and the body. And I'd say, well, wait a minute. I'm so intricately connected with everything else, my oxygen and my lungs and, the, yeah. and everything. Well, I have to scan the whole universe there. So I don't understand well, what you mean by scanning. So it's not about making a perfect identical copy of you. It's about making something that's functionally equivalent. It doesn't have to be equal Functionally to you. equivalent. So the whole With all my problems? I mean, I yeah. kind of the Freudian slip. Is it going to do Freudian slips the way I do? It's going to trip over... over what the world economy mainly wants is workers. People who can work as well as humans. Do I care about the world economy? You don't... It may not care what you care about. I see. So, so it's going to say, I'm an econ... I'm, yes, I'm the world economy. economy is going to want to hire emulations and hire them all over the place. And if it hires them, it won't hire you and you'll be in trouble. Well, wait a minute. Haven't you ever heard of this guy who's it in the in the Ma not the Matrix, the, the Terminator, John? Uh, who's yeah. John? Who comes back and saves the world and kills all the machines because the machines are so inhumane? You don't believe in this guy, then? What is his name? John something? Connor? Right? Yeah, that's it. John Connor. So you're not a John Connor fan. You don't think John Connor will rally the underdogs and say, "To hell with the economy. We want to humanize this thing." We've already seen a number of large transitions of a similar magnitude. It was a transition from primates to humans, from a transition from, from foraging to farming, and from farming to industry. These were three enormous revolutions. In each revolution, the doubling time of the economy suddenly switched within less than half a previous doubling time to doubling a hundred times or more. So these were all very sudden things. There were enormous transitions, and in each case, you could have asked this question: What if, what if the previous people had realized what was coming? Could they have stopped it? Well, th no, John Connor didn't really realize it. He just was living it, and then he says, hey, you're taking away my job. It's kind of like the Luddites, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And you don't think the Luddites will ever win? So during the Industrial Revolution, there were definitely people who uh, saw the Industrial Revolution coming and thought it wasn't in their interest, and they resisted. But they weren't remotely at the level of being able to stop it. It wasn't even close. Well, Teddy Roosevelt did some things, and you know Franklin Roosevelt did some things to humanize the the great what are these magnates, these great corporate railroad owners, right? And it, they didn't let them run roughshod over the people. They had created work, for example. And there, there has been regulation. There has been some government interference, but it hasn't dramatically changed the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution has played out pretty similarly all across the world with very different governments. Really. Okay, so what? So what's coming now? So your children, you have children? Do you have yes, two. Okay, are they going to have a job? So when the age of M shows up, it'd be, say, a period of five years from an ordinary world like we are now to a completely different world. Once we're in the age of M, humans basically don't have jobs. They all have to retire. But they Humans all retire? So your children are going to retire at age 20? Whenever it happens, they'll have to retire. When will this happen? Sometime in the next century. I'm not sure when. Five years, ten years, fifty years? Sometime in the next century. Is Come on, I've heard this tech, the singularity, approaching singularity time scale. I mean, who is it that, who's the approaching singularity guy? Kurzweil. Uh, well, Kurzweil. Doesn't he give a time frame of you know, 40 years plus or minus 30 <laughs> seconds or something? Kurzweil has given a number of time frames over the years. They've changed a little. This <laughs> okay. previous deadline's okay. passed. And so that's so, in respect to that or with, with regard to that, Knowing that you don't want to, you don't want to pin yourself down too much. Is that right? The idea. I want to say the things I can say. Uh -huh. I'm trying to be a, a good, rigorous, careful academic who says the things he can say and on the things he can't speak doesn't say. Uh -huh. Of the, which you shouldn't <laughs> speak. Okay. Of which you can't speak. You shouldn't. All right. So let me get this straight. You think that we're going to machines are going to take over the world? 
Wait, robots rule the earth. Yeah. Robot. Now these robots, they're going to, that's a pic. Can you show us the picture of the robots ruling the earth? Well, this there? isn't really a picture pic of what, robots exactly. It's, it's a, a picture of an earth covered with buildings, really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely Do all the, earth uh, covered. Which are, the, is any of those buildings a robot? No, no, they're not. It's they're just an uh, artistic <laughs> picture okay. that works on the cover. Okay. It's, it's a nice picture. It gives you a sense of, of a very all active right. world. So you seem to be very sure of this, right? So, I don't mean to say I'm very sure. Well, you sound very sure of it. Do you well, say, let me be clear. Because I'm trying to defend John Connor, and you're just having none of that. Hey, it's happened before. So. so, my book is assuming that emulations are the first really big change that happens next. My book is trying to analyze all the consequences of that. I don't How think, likely is that? I, I think it's more than 1%. Unless maybe the, more than in the range of you know 10 to 20, 30%. But it's not 100% at all. Okay, so if it, let's say it's a few percent. Uh, now, if that's the case, where, how, what's your, how do you answer the Fermi's paradox? Where are they then? Why has this, haven't this already happened a million times in our galaxy and then the robots rule the Earth uh, from another planet? The rate we've been growing now is plenty to fill the galaxy in a short time. The rate we've been growing as, as farmers was enough. Doubling every thousand years, you can't do that for a million years. You run into limits. And so uh, if we had been able to keep growing at any of the recent growth rates, we would fill the galaxy in a short time. So that means so it doesn't really galaxy... matter whether you have farmers or no, industrial No, 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 my robots. question is why hasn't it already been filled though? By another the, society? So the obvious inference we must draw is that it's hard. Okay, and what makes it hard? Uh, yeah, and let's talk about your great filter. Let's yes. say, okay, well, tell us about your great filter. So if you look at any one chunk of matter at the beginning of the universe and you ask, could that one chunk of matter be the birthplace of civilization? Could it start the origins of life, then the next stage of life, then maybe life with sex, life with multicellular animals, life with civilization, going all the way down a path until it becomes us and then becomes more than advanced us. What's the chance of any one small piece doing it? The idea is the chance is really small. The chance must be really small because the sum total of all the chances of everything in the universe uh, has to be small because we don't see anything out there. So the, the basic fact is the universe looks empty and dead. And that one datum tells us it must be a very low probability for any one small place that starts to eventually lead to a civilization that makes a visible impact on the universe. So maybe the biggest problem is getting life started. Maybe. That is one potential step in the filter. So the great filter is the sequence of steps we have to go through, each of which is hard. A hard step is where lots of things try and only a few succeed, at least within a reasonable time scale. And so if there's lots of things you have to do that are hard, then the total is even harder, and that is the great filter. And so we, what we want to know is where was it hard? Where along the path from starting with simple dead matter to a visible expanding civilization, where along that path is most of the filter? Where are most of the hard steps, the difficult things that, me, that mean most things that try fail? Now, for me, this, this great filter sounds like a great idea, except I have a problem. It sounds like I a ladder on this quicksand. And the quicksand that this ladder is on is called, what makes you think there are stages at all to anything about biology? You know, if you talk about, you know, history is one damn thing after another, biology seems to also be one damn thing after another, except you're, right. you're painting biology in a linear direction towards us, essentially. So, for example, let's suppose that, uh, you know, well, any time you pick yeah. anything, uh, here's an atom, here's a hydrogen atom, What's the great filter that led to this hydrogen atom here? Well, I have no idea what the stages are, so it doesn't even make sense about the stages. It reminds me of an IQ test. Yeah. Hey, I'm measuring something. At, and uh, by the way, what I'm measuring is what I've decided is intelligence, but there are billions of times of so different intelligence, the, and so it's an n-dimensional thing. So how do you put so a stage the, to it? There's two concepts to anchor on here. One is whatever it takes to make an expanding visible civilization. That's the key data. Oh, an expanding visible, visible civ civilization. That's, that's what we don't see. We yes, look up and we but don't. why should you expect to see that? I don't expect to see English being spoken out there. We, English is a really quirky thing, but you're putting an advanced civilization in a non-quirky category, and that's my question. It's the data point. We look the, out, it all looks dead. So that we have to anchor on that data point. However you want to call it, whatever name you want to give it to it, it's the key data point. It all looks dead. Then there's the, another... The question is whether that's important or sure. not, right? There's the other key point of we are here now and we came along a path. Yes. And yes. we can envision a path between us and this final data point that's missing, i.e. Well, being an experience. So those well, that, are, that's the last, that, that last part. Say that again, because that's the part that I, I don't follow. We can imagine yeah. 
plausible scenarios, not obviously true, by which we will continue to grow from where we are to becoming so big and visible that other civilizations, if they looked out at the universe, they would see us. So that is a path. I don't mean to say it's the only possible path. There could be many paths from a dead universe to a thing that's visible in the universe. We don't have to be on the only path there is, but we are plausibly on a path. That is, we've come along a path and there is a plausible path ahead of us that could eventually lead to a visible civilization. And it's interesting to ask along that path, how hard was it? Well, we can think about other paths and how hard those well, paths Well, wait a minute, but that when you look at paths, there's something called, I guess, sets of measure zero. Yeah. And I guess, I'm in my head, the path that you're envisioning may be a set of measure zero. Not as 1%, not an epsilon percent, but a set of measure, just like English is probably a set of measure zero in the universe. Oh, but the set of all states wherein you'd see something in the universe that was visible, that is a measurable set. That is the measure that we're asking about. We're basically saying, look, it looks what? empty. We need a theory that predicts a low measure for that. Okay, because well, the key wait, data point is we don't see it. Well, wait a minute. What about English? Is English a set of measure zero in the universe? Uh, depends on how narrowly you define it. It's certainly a very small set. Well, zero, it includes say. Scottish accent, American accent, and British not accent. Certain. Not zero, no. It's not? No, of course So not. you expect there's going to be other English-speaking critters out there? If you go far enough. Really? Well, because languages have a finite set of elements, and so if you put a, any sort of reasonable prior over a finite set of elements, you'll get a finite prior. So yes, there's a finite probability for any set of finite languages. So there's some Portuguese colonies out there. If you go far enough, if, and if the universe is infinite, of course, in, in spatial extent. Yeah. We don't know if it's infinite in spatial extent. We're pretty sure it's really wide. Huh. But we don't know how far. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask you the question. Are we alone? Humans are alone on Earth as intelligent civilization. We are the only intelligent civilization on Earth. We are the only one we've ever seen anywhere in the universe, and that's puzzling because uh, we think we have a chance to become something more than we are. Okay. We have a chance to become something visible. Okay, so it's the fact that, that we have this chance of becoming something visible is what makes us different from other species. For example, yeah, behind you, you have a tree. I'm not right. kind of sure what kind of tree it is. Let's say it's a maple tree. Yeah, they, they don't, now, it doesn't look like it has mostly the same chance of becoming visible in the galaxy, and in the universe, it, exactly. Well, it's making an oxygen, and the oxygen yeah. is visible in the galaxy. But you'd have to be really good at seeing to see that. So, but I'm talking about something that's really obvious, something that's so visibly obvious that you really couldn't miss it. That's what I mean by visible. Uh -huh. That is, uh, if we expand and take over the solar system and even the galaxy, we would do it in a big way, not just every you know few billion particles once in a while will change it a little, and in case you look really close, you'll see a little difference. We might aggressively change it. We might use it as much as we could in the same way we use land and machines and oil and other things around us when they are convenient and things we want to use, they, I, we use them. I, but you're telling me that we're not using them, they're going to start using us. The robots. Yes. Well, the, well, the machines, ro the robots. I, mean, I would say the robots are us in a certain sense. So they are our descendants. Well, so our descendants may use the universe. Well, we, bacteria can say the same thing. Hey, bacteria, sure. you, we are yes. the descendants of bacteria, though. Of course. And then the atoms can say the same thing because the atoms are kind of got together and formed Fine. the bacteria. Say it if you like. Sure. Well, I'm just trying to understand the, this process, this, uh, this pathway that you're envisioning that's not a set of measure zero. We are um, a specific species on a specific planet. The more detail you describe about us, the less likely that description is yes. to have arisen. Yes. But you don't have to go all the way down to all the little details because we don't care about all that detail fundamentally. What do we care about? We primarily care about the fact that we're here and we're capable of expanding and becoming something much bigger. That's the key fact that we're thinking about. Capable here. of becoming, so you're talking about building rocket ships and sending them to other planets and radio telescopes and looking around and being self-aware and stuff like that? Taking stars apart. <laughs> Taking stars apart. Reassembling stars, uh, making big black hole machines that uh, produce well, stars do that when they collide, take the well, yes, apart. But I think we don't, the, the energy just gets lost. So we so can make lots of turns into fusion to make iron in there. Well, in the stars, kind of... yeah. The black holes, when they throw the gal when gravity waves out, they just fly to the end of the universe and they don't ever get used, right? So, wait, 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 when you say used, what does the word used mean? To use, to say use, to have the word used, you have to have a user. And so sure. I'm trying to question what it is a user. Can a ro if a robot can be a user, and you yeah. have a, then why can't, a, can a star be a user? Because a star is using the hydrogen to turn it into helium? Or is that too... What? There is a difference between dead matter and living matter. 
There is even wait, a wait, difference wait, between. There is. Why do you say that? Because, like, like for example, as a scientist, you know that a living matter evolved from dead matter. Yes, right? of course. They're so made that, out of the same things, but they are arranged differently. Less, arranged. Life is different from death, in because of the arrangement and use. Yes, living matter uses entropy in ways that dead matter doesn't. Because a virus use things. Yes. So a virus is alive. Yes. How about a prion? A prion use things. Sure. Okay, how about a fire? Does a fire use wood? Uh, a hurricane use a pressure gradient? As you probably know, there's a whole literature on <laughs> different <laughs> levels of organization and complexity, yeah. and you can, of course, argue about exactly where you would draw the line, but in actual practice, there's just a huge difference, right? So wait, 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 draw the line. I, I don't want to draw a line, but you're trying to draw a line. You say there's a huge difference, and I'm trying to say, no, there's not. And so what does that get us? I don't need there to be a line I meet. A continuum is fine. I just need to notice that a key fact about the universe is some parts of it are dead and some parts are alive. This is a key fact to notice. We can define it in different ways, maybe. We can make subtler judgments, but there's this basic big fact. Life is just different than death, right? Well, you think so, but I, no, I, I, I guess I would not disagree. Uh, that would be, I think it, we shouldn't talk about it, though, because it's like too philosophical. It's supposed to be scientists. Can we, can, I mean, there's all kinds of, things that people have argued about what life is. For example, in astrobiology, we try to define life. And, for example, people say, oh, it has to be self-reproducing. And then I say to my students, okay, you take a man or a woman in their 20s, put them in a hermetically sealed capsule in outer space, they will not reproduce, they'll die. So the whole point right. is, okay, so what, if they can't reproduce, then what is alive? Uh, in the same, you know, I've heard grandma arguments and et cetera. But this, this is just the standard issue about how you do definitions in language at all. Most words in language do not have precise logical definitions. Right. It's just not the way language usually works. Sure. Okay? And maybe that's Most the way words in either. language, uh, we have a number of prototypes. We infer uh, commonality and rough separation between prototypes, and that's all we usually need for most words. And life is a word that, for which that attitude works just fine. Not if you're interested in the origin of life from non-life. You don't need to define life to be interested in the origin of life. You just need to understand right, right, and think right, about what right. processes right. could have led from one state right, to the exactly. other. There, I'm, I'm totally with you. But yeah. if that's the case, then you have a, you have something here, let's say dead, and something here called alive, and therefore there's a process that leads yes, to of it. Course. And if there's a process, that means there are states here that you cannot say it's alive or dead. That follows from what or, that or a there, naturalistic understanding of. Or there could of, be a continuum along which there is variation. Sure. Right. So if it's a continuum, so but, but still, there's a huge visible difference in our world, right? Well, Around know. us, life. Come on, the trees, the grass. They are really people are dramatically you're different from the dead rocks. You're talking to a fan of Lovelock, <laughs> right? So I'm a, a little bit of a guy. I think. So what do you think of the idea of Gaia? Because that's, uh, that's such a situation where it isn't clear whether it's alive or not, the biosphere, so, for example. Uh, the issue is the degree to which life coordinates at a global scale. It seems a priori unlikely to me, but I don't have a strong opinion. Uh, life is really finds it really hard to coordinate on much smaller scales than that. So it would be really surprising if somehow it can manage to coordinate at a global scale, yet it fails to coordinate in vastly slower, smaller scales than that. So you're using coordination of material as a definition here of life then. I'm an economist. Coordination is a key concept we think in terms of. So like hurricanes going around and around and around. That's no. coordination of on about five hundred kilometers. Coordination scale. of interests. So the idea is that when you have different so we think in terms of creatures with interests and that is a reasonable approximation of biology. Creatures with interests. That is Animals and even species have interests, i.e. things that are in their interests. Wait, wait, wait. I, I read Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene. The genes have the interest, then the people are just there as castles built by the genes. The ge people have no interest. Well, you might say the genetic or the gene interest is more fundamental, but still it can induce uh, interests of larger organisms, too. So mm -hmm. genes have interests, organisms have interests, even species can have interest to some degree. And so we have this concept of interest that makes sense to us because we see competing things with interest. So it's when you say with, for the good of something, right? So we do things for the good of well, our species, or the good of our group, or the good of our bodies, the good of our genes. and individuals do things in their interests. They try to achieve interest. And coordination is how we talk about multiple things with different interests commonly achieving their interests. How about half a gene? I don't really care how you're going to split it out. It's not that interesting <laughs> to me. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. This sometimes word. it's useful to think in terms of interest. It's a com it's a thing that helps in economics, yes, it helps bono, in right? biology, who, who it helps in legal things. Hey, sure, who, who benefits from this thing? Right, exactly. And so coordination is a concept framed in terms of interest. Once you have individuals pursuing their interests, sometimes they can fail to coordinate, so that they each 
don't achieve their interests, and other times they can coordinate in such a way that they all achieve more of their interests via the coordination. It's hard, but it's often worth it. And so we think in terms of organisms being a coordination of cells, uh, a genome being a coordination of genes, we think of society as being a coordination of individuals, and therefore we can think of the coordination of all life on Earth, and that's what I understand Gaia to be, a hypothesis that somehow life on Earth is managing to coordinate on a global scale in ways that are not very visible. That would be very surprising to me because when I study and look at coordination on much smaller scales, I find that it ends up being very hard. It's even hard for organisms to coordinate their genes. It's hard for communities to coordinate individuals. The larger a scale of coordination we go to, the more difficult and more often it seems to fail. And so I would think that if we went to the global scale, we would just mostly see failure to coordinate. But I could be wrong. Hmm. Okay. Um now, did I, I've asked you the question, are we alone? What was your answer to that question? Are we alone? Humans on Earth are alone in Earth and the solar system, at least, in terms of other civilizations at our level. Everywhere we've seen in the universe, it looks empty, so it looks alone. But we understand now in cosmology that the universe goes along a lot farther than we can see. We expect the universe is many, many orders of magnitude larger than what we can see. And so, if it goes on a really long way out there, there's probably something else out there that's as advanced as we are a long way away. Whether it's in our visible universe, though, that's much less clear. Okay. And uh, have you ever seen a UFO? Have I ever seen something I didn't understand? <laughs> I'm sure no, an unidentified flying object. Yes, but I have seen things I didn't understand, but that doesn't make them UFOs according to the... Uh, parlance of, of so, what a UFO is. So, so I don't what, think I've ever seen something I thought was so puzzling I attribute it to being aliens or something. Right, that that so, never seemed a plausible hypothesis for anything I've ever seen. Okay, so what were these unidentified flying objects that you saw that you figured out that it wasn't an alien but it was... I don't even know what... I mean, when I was a kid, I imagine I looked up... I remember looking up at the sky and seeing funny clouds or funny shot lights and I wondered what they were. I've seen you know, things moving around. I said, gee, that's moving fast. Could that really be a plane? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know at the time exactly what it was but I'm pretty sure now that it must have been <laughs> something pretty ordinary. Okay, uh, is the question, are we alone, an important question? Why, are you seem to be interested, I'm interested yeah. in it. Why, why should we be interested in it? I mean, can I just ignore it for the rest of my life and then die? Well, eventually our descendants may meet up with others out there, and on the largest time scales, that would dominate what happens. That is, if we meet up with aliens and they're hostile, uh, that could well be the end of us. The end of us, unless yeah. unless we have like fifth column people who want to <laughs> want to join in and kind of Maybe. sell their souls. But you know, on the very longest time scale, if there are aliens out there and we might meet them, that will determine our long term history. So that it's important in that sense. Of course, that's nothing short time. That that's uh, nothing very soon. Uh, it's almost certain that this is a very long way away in time that we would meet them up. But eventually, if our descendants did meet them, that would determine their future history. Is it so far in the future that we shouldn't care about it? Uh, it's getting near that point. <laughs> so it, it feels nice to care about the distant future, but when you try to think about how to do it practically, you start to realize that all the uncertainties between here and there really get in the way of doing anything useful about the distant future. So that's partly why when I wrote my book, I tried to describe the next great era after ours that's as different from our era as our was for the previous eras. Many people have asked me what happens after the age of M, and I say mostly, I don't know. Uh -huh. I can't promise to tell you the history of the universe for the next trillion years. I maybe can tell you about the next great era after ours. I see. How about, you know, this guy, Yuri Mil Wilner, who donated a hundred million dollars to Project Breakthrough Listen or something. If I gave you, not a hundred million, let's give you, I'll give you a hundred billion dollars. Yeah. And with the caveat, you have to help answer this question, are we alone? What would you do with that hundred billion dollars? Well, the obvious strategy, it seems to me, is the one that people rarely do, which is wait. Wait. Save so, the money, invest it, it'll grow, and <laughs> our technology will get better. Well, wait a hundred years, but we'll be so much better <laughs> able to answer these questions with the same amount of money. So the, I, I've heard that it's, it's called waiting for extraterrestrials, so waiting is called. No, but and not, not waiting for them to show up, just waiting to spend the money later. Whatever you're going to do with the I money. I see. The, well, that reminds it. me of the computer analyst who wants to do a simulation. He says, you know what, if I just wait six months, my computer will be faster and I'll catch up and then the six months later exactly. if I just wait so you wait forever and you no, don't you really don't wait forever but you do wait if it, it works pretty so this is a basic question to ask about all research and I wish it were asked more often 
not is the question, just is the question interesting, but why do we need the answer now? Right. So in social science, there's a lot of important things where if we find the answer now, we could change the way we do things and it'll make a difference. The way we do patents, say, the way we do uh, privacy, all sorts of questions, if we studied them and had answers, we could change the way we ran our lives and that might be for the better now. That gives us an urgency to want to answer the questions now. But many questions in cosmology are about aliens. You got to ask, why do we need the answer now? Why not wait a little while? Well, I do astronomy and yeah. uh, astronomy is not often accused of being a pl an applied science. So <laughs> if I try to sell that line, hey, why do we need to know the age of the universe now? Yeah. You know, if, if we wait 100 years, we'll be 100 years older. Will that make any difference? And you, there you go. I guess the answer is no. Right. So you think it shouldn't be funded at all? Less. You should be funded less? Less. Okay, so cosmology is overfunded. Yeah. So if you were in charge of the universe and you were the one giving out the money, who would you fund and who would you pull money from? I would do it on the criteria of what can they do in a near enough term to get a return on the investment. Yes, you want you want research to be an investment, you want a return on the investment, and returns on investment, the time scale matters. It matters when you get the returns. You sound like you a second it. world economist, because in the first world we do blue sky research, and when, but when I go, went to Nigeria, for example, they everything was applied science. I want my corn to get yeah. rid of the fungus. I want this over here. I want my water stream. And then, but as to you know, blue sky research, none, there's no time because I want it now. On the other hand, when you do the blue sky research, which has no relevance to anything, boom, all of a sudden it dominates the world because now we can do, we have computers, wow. for example. Now we have the medical devices. I, all of that was blue sky research that had nothing to do with now at the time. Academics who do basic research try to grab a little too much credit for economic growth. <laughs> Economic growth. <laughs> For the, the fact that we're rich isn't that much due to previous blue sky academic research. Really? Researchers. I thought it was all due to that. No, that's that's. What do you think is due you. to? Uh, most of most of uh, innovation is due to um, activity, really. Uh, so research and development actually is a minor contribution to innovation in general. Uh, basic research is an even smaller contribution. Uh, most innovation happens because people try to make new products, they try to develop new techniques, they do things and they use them and they learn in the process of doing them. That's where most innovation comes from. But honestly, we aren't actually funding research in order to pr improve the economy anyway. I, I, so right. if I stand back and be a social scientist, I say, that's just a crazy social theory anyway. We mostly do research to be impressive. We do research to be impressive. To whom? Yes. To our spouses or to other countries? Or? All, the, all On all different scales. So you might think that because... Um, research is this global public good that we should all be contributing to a global fund to fund research. But that's not what happens. Each nation is eager to fund its own research and contribute to this global public good, which is doing research. Why are all these nations so eager to do the research themselves rather than contribute to a fund to have everybody do the research? Because they like to be impressive. This is often why many companies do research. Many firms do research in order to be impressive. They create national, international reputations for being firms that are at the head of their field because they do research. And that's one of the main reasons firms do research. I'm, I'm confused here because I think it's very important to know how you got here, uh, the scientific story of Genesis. Yeah. And But by your criterion, you'd say, well, that doesn't have any applicability, that doesn't do anything, you shouldn't be even thinking about that. On the other hand, people have this, I think, intrinsic need to know how they got here. It's kind of like a religious thing yeah. of, hey, I want to know who I am, self-identity. So, for example, Copernicus is like, hey, we're going to make everything going around in circles, the sun is... And when you do that, that, sh that creates, at least from a scientific point of view, a revolution which changes everything about but, society. But let me just go back to basics. Okay. You're talking about, you ask me, who, should, who would I fund? Right, right, right. I'm going to do it based on my preferences. Right, right. They and don't your have to be your preferences. I know that, I they, know they, that. They, so it's based on my priorities. And your so priorities are? My priorities are to feed the starving, uh, lift up the poor, feed the starving, build the economy, build civilization so that we become a bigger, more successful, happier uh, civilization. That is my priority. I have less priority on answering fundamental questions. Now, I have some priority, and I'm personally interested in them. I put some personal time into them, but I don't think it's a priority for the world. I don't really expect other people to pay for it. Uh, if I'm spending other people's money, I want to get them something for it. And I think mostly the world wants uh, prosperity. Prosperity? How much prosperity? Growth. How rich do we want to get? Well, in my book, The Age of M, it's a future where per capita wealth falls for the emulation. So we've gotten use over the last century or two to increasing per capita wealth. And that's not a permanent feature of the future. It's a temporary feature of our era. Because we have had really poor technology for 
increasing the population, we've been able to grow wealth faster than we can grow the population, and that's meant that wealth per person has increased. But that's only because we have a really lousy technology for increasing the nut size of the population. In the age of M, they are able to increase the population of emulations of computers very quickly, and that means the wealth per person uh, falls down to subsistence level, even though the economy is going to be growing and innovating very rapidly. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, are we living in a simulation? Unlikely. Why? But possible. I, many people think it's very likely because they yes. take what you've said very seriously and they say all civilizations would turn in yes. and make, create simulations. Simulations are cheaper than reality, therefore uh, we must be living in a simulation because of all the things that so, are like us, most of them are simulations. You know the argument. The Great Filter warns us that we may not last. That is, there's a substantial chance that our descendants won't even exist, that civilization will die and end. So somebody's got to press the button and just stop Something the simulation? Something will go wrong. That, no, not, not as a simulation, just, just our world will end. But, so that's a reason to think our descendants may not exist. But if our descendants exist, they will probably be powerful and rich and large. That is, there will be many of them, trillions and far so more. So they can make simulations. So I do think this future, if it doesn't destroy itself, will be large and rich and capable of many, running many simulations of us, but so, they don't think they will. That is, I really think, don't think they're that interested in simulating us. Well, we're doing all kinds of simulations but of But not computers. mostly of our distant ancestors. Take a typical... F no, 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 I'm thinking about other civilizations saying, hey, right. you know, some guys say, hey, I'm going to make a simulation of a real world, look at this, and to impress their we, other... We mostly simulate and emulate things like us. We're very interested in recent wars or recent uh, video games of people like us. Yes. If we go back to people 5,000 years ago, almost nobody in our world wants to simulate or emulate or even read stories about people from 5,000 years ago. Right. They're boring to us. We could simulate and emulate them. We could talk about them, but we don't. We have vast resources that if we wanted to, we could, but we don't. So if I hear you correctly, I studied history, but if you were in charge of the university where I was, you would We'll have a lot of courses of the history of the future, talking about what's going to happen in the future and not so much the study of the past because the past is already gone, you can't do anything about it. And I might make them more e comparable at least at the moment. The, the ratio is enormously the other way, of course. Yes, yes. Huh. So, all right, you make them more comparable. Um, okay, you've never been abducted, I guess, right? <laughs> not remotely. All right, now, I, did you answer this question, what happens if I give you $100 billion to solve look for aliens, you said you would do what? Again? Wait. You'd wait. So Spend the money later. Okay, so you'd use the money to try to ensure your own survival. Is that what another well, way to that, say that? That would be in, indirect, but I would just invest the money and have more money to spend later. Unless so, there's a stock market crash and then you lose everything. If you, say, if you give me a task and say, learn the answer to this question, and you don't tell me it's urgent to know the answer now, uh -huh. I'll say, well, let's wait. Let's answer the question later. I'll still answer that question, and later on I'll spend money to answer it. But I why see. spend the money now if money spent later would be more effective, well, and you don't need the answer? Well, that's now. what I thought when I was hired, and then they took the money that they said they were going to give to me, and they took it away from me because I hadn't spent it. And so all over the yeah, world, well, people are spending money because they th they know that it will be taken away from that's, them. We economists call that insecure property rights. Yes. Insecure property One rights. One reason for spending things now is because you are afraid it will be stolen between now and later. And it was again and again. Yes, so of that's course. A, so you, that's so, and in history, many people have lost their wealth because it was stolen, and that's been a reason why people have been reluctant to save through history. It remains a reason people are reluctant to save now, and it, it would be a reason to be cautious about saving too much, but still, over the last century or two, we've seen a certain rate at which savings have accumulated and a rate at which it's been stolen. And yeah. given that rate, it would still be worth I investing and saving to answer the questions later. All right. Well, what situation would come about that would convince you to invest in trying to answer this question? You mean if I were saving the money, yeah, when would saying? I stop saving and start to spend? Yes. Well, one thing is, is if I saw that whatever technologies were improving such that I was, things were getting better, they were about to stop improving, or they had just stopped improving. That is, the key technology of building a telescope or whatever I'm doing to look for aliens, if that technology seemed to reach a saturation, reach a limiting point where it just couldn't grow very much further, then that would be a reason to maybe start spending oh, them. Okay, so what you're doing is you're waiting and then watching the technology that we will eventually use improve, 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 and then if it saturates a level, then you'd say, you know what, since it's not going to improve much, I'm going to invest now because... 
Uh -huh. that's, that's one reason. That's one reason. The other Another reason, reason might be if the question became more urgent, if I had more reason to want to know the answer. So you don't think uh, world war, you don't think Donald Trump and other these people who are going to make the world just destroy the world in the next few years are important to find out, reach out to another planet and get us there before the world goes kaput? Don't you think? I mean, this big brain that we have, you know, yeah. robots. It's very unstable, it seems to me. And there's all kinds of things, bioterrorism or... If you want to save civilization by sending some arcs away from here so yes. that if something goes wrong here, those arcs are saved, that sounds like a great cause. It's just not the cause of looking for aliens that you test me Sure with. it is, because if you know that everybody on Earth's going to die, you're going to have... You're going to... SETI program will continue on the moon or Mars or something. So it is a looking for... It, it sounds like it would be an excuse. That is, you're, you're going to have an arc but you're going to make the excuse that you're looking for aliens for the ARC. If that's what the excuse it takes to get the ARC funded, maybe that's what you'd have to do. Well, but it's not an excuse. It's just that if I gave you $100 billion yeah. and you're telling me, okay, I'm going to invest, and I'm saying, the world is coming to an end here in the Earth, yeah. and I say, well, the best thing to do then, remember, I only gave yeah. you this money if you could answer this question, then it seems to me that this ARC has a big justification. Right. Well, you're just saying there's... A rash, multiple rationales for spending. That is, when you have a budget and it's got a color of money on it, it says only to be used for dinner, yeah. and you want to spend it on something else, you have to find a way that dinner and something else are the same thing, right? Well, you want to survive <laughs> until dinner. Sure, right. right? That's, the, that's the number <laughs> okay, one thing. Sure. You have to survive long, you have to have an observer, <laughs> sure. and then the observer has to find the aliens. I, you know, honestly, if I thought we were about, we were at risk of being killed off, and I had a pile of money I could spend in some way even lying about it so that I could save us from dying off, I might well spend it in that way to save us from dying off. If right. I could make up an excuse so that it sounds like I'm not lying, all the better. But of course, yes, saving us from being killed off is, is a good reason to do most anything. Huh, okay. All right. Uh, how about, could we be living inside of an alien now? Could we be part of an alien? It's kind of like you, you have a neurons in your head and they don't know they're part of your head. They don't know you're part of your brain. But you could imagine some scenarios that, okay, cell in your brain. If you do this, you could find out that you're part of a, a brain. Now, is there anything we can do in this hypothesis? We're part of an alien here. What can we do? I can only, is that um, too crazy? I can only understand two ways to make sense of this scenario. One is the simulation argument that you mentioned, and that the world around us just is not what it seems. Okay. And we are not in the world we think we're in. Oh, we are in some, you like know, the Truman Show. Right. So what we, we should are do is sail away into the... alien starship or a simulation right. world, right. and therefore... So we should break out of the bucket. Our brain should figure right. out that it's in a bucket. Right. That would be one scenario in which you could say we are part of this alien, and we the first order of business there is to figure out the actual situation assessment. Yeah, how does the brain that's in a bucket figure out that it's in a bucket? Uh, it could, probably pretty hard because whoever put you in the bucket didn't want you to know, right? Uh -huh. So unless they really had some reason they wanted you to know and they just wanted you to pass a test before you could find out, <laughs> then you could try to pass the test. But if they really didn't want you to know, there's pretty much nothing you could do to find out, really. <laughs> all right, how about nano-aliens? You know, maybe there are nano-aliens all around us and we've only seen unidentified objects in scanning electron microscopy and people just ignoring it. The main puzzle is that we expect competitive life to expand the resources that it uses uh, nearly as much as it can. So on Earth, life has expanded to use as many of the resources that it could use. It's been limited in which kind of resources it can make great use of, but the things it can use, it has. Different bacteria and different animals competed and pretty much have filled all the niches that are available to be filled. So if the same thing happens for aliens in the galaxy, uh, wherever they can go and use resources and fill them, then we expect them to do that. That makes it puzzling for there to be a tiny fraction of nano aliens around us, and why aren't they using a lot more than they could? If they really were aliens around us who are capable of using more than they are, why are they limiting themselves to only using a tiny fraction of what they have? So you think there's a universal drive to use as much free energy as possible? I do think there's a relatively universal competitive tendency to use resources, yes. And the sh uh, well, when you say the word use, then we have to, then we have a debate between long term and short term. If you want to have long term, then off that often means you preserve a, f a park. If you want short term, you cut down all the trees and burn them, and then you know to get the money. So well, a park is more is less of a direct use of a resource than perhaps an enjoyment of it. But uh, of course, using resources can include investment. It can include uh, waiting until the right time to use something. But you still expect a lot of things to get used. And so, again, if, the, we're, if there's lots of nano-aliens all around us, the puzzle is, well, why have they been s using so little for so long? It's not 
the hypothesis isn't that they showed up yesterday, it's they've been around for a long time. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so they have to have been around for a long time not using things. Okay, and you don't So what are they that... waiting for? What could they be waiting for? You're saying, well, they haven't used it yet because they're waiting to use it later. No, no, I'm not saying that I'm not subscribing necessarily to the this universal compunction to use on a short time scale that makes it out. I mean, no, but, but on some time scale, there's got to be some time well, scale. No, no, I don't think there has to be. Uh, for example, you know Arthur C. Clarke. Sure. And he wrote, he said that, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And there's a guy called Carl Schroeder. And Carl Schroeder said, no, no, Arthur, you're all wrong about that. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. That's what Carl said. Yeah, I think he's wrong. I know you think he's wrong, but, but I mean, there's, I guess it's kind of like saying, hey, when you get sufficiently advanced, you learn to live with things rather than use them. You've been using use yeah, them. I don't think that's right at all. So, so you're not a big fan of symbiosis, all getting along, tree hugging, and loving nature, and letting nature be. Cooperation and... is a big part of advancement. It so I'm definitely, but is. cooperation to achieve what you want by using things is the key kind of cooperation. Cooperating to not use things. No, I, exactly say, I didn't say that? not use things. I said just cooperation as a form of survival. I mean, this is the problem about how do you. How do you even explain yes. multicellularity, for example? These cells are all fighting to use things, and then all of a sudden, hey, they get together and they form a thing that... We see a lot of cooperation in nature, but it's still mostly in the service of using as much as it can. Nature does mostly not leave much things sur... unused. Well... Does it? Well, I, it depends on what you... See, you use this word, uh, use, Yes. and I'm unfamiliar with this because... To, have, to use to use as a verb, you need a user, a noun. To have a yes. user, you have to identify the unit of selection. Now, that user, sure. for me, could be anything from a human being, a group of human beings. It could be Gaia. It could yes. maybe be a star, maybe a galaxy, maybe an atom, a molecule. I have no idea what it means because it's so un poorly defined but for me. The concept of coordination tells you what it means. No, so it doesn't because you coordination is not a well-defined term either. I asked about a hurricane, a coordinated wind. You said, well, that's not really a but coordination. But I explained that coordination was about coordinating interests. Hurricanes don't have interests yeah, and they can't coordinate the interests. Well, how, so you how much like a human being do you have to be before you have interests. You start with small things. We talked about genes having interests. We talked about organisms having interests. Well, how about the half a gene? I asked you and you said, oh, that's semantic. I, said, I don't know. Okay. So, but, but we already know that there are genes that have interests. We know there are organisms that have interests. And we yes. know that if they can coordinate well enough, they can form a unit that also has an interest. That's a generic feature of, of a, aggregation. Which is, is part of a larger unit, which has interest, part of a larger unit that has interest. If so you have they a... can coordinate. It's a matter of the ability to coordinate. If you have things that don't coordinate very well, then they really can't well, create a unit Coordination is a function of being selected for that coordination, right? It is hard to coordinate. Some things manage to achieve it and some things don't. Sometimes strongly... selection can contribute to the ability to coordinate. I think that's the only thing that can contribute. That's the only thing that can create coordination that you're talking about. Well, only selection. if it's the only thing that can create anything, I guess. Right, right exactly. So, <laughs> well, in, in, if you're going to call yeah. it life form, right? If you want to focus on that. Now, when we think about the economy, we don't think about the main driving force in the economy necessarily being selection. Because we okay. think of there's these pre-existing minds see. that have been selected before and they are acting to achieve things. Uh, right. You could think of them as indirectly acting out selection, but, but that's not very useful. Okay, do you have anything to say about Boltzmann brains? That's, uh, have you ever heard, I you was, know what these guys are? Yes, of course. Uh, I was, was proud of, Sh uh, you know, Sean Carroll. Yeah, yeah. He had a book where he was uh, trying to uh, explain the increase in entropy. As you know, uh, the arrow of time is a fundamental puzzle, and he was trying to explain that by saying, well, there is no maximum entropy, and that's why it might always increase. And his reason for explaining maximum entropy was by saying, well, because there could be baby universes and they could expand more universes, and that's why there would not be a maximum entropy. And his uh, basic calculation for how baby universes could con be constructed was based on a certain way of framing quantum mechanical fluctuations that uh, interpreted them as possibly creating baby universes. And those same quantum mechanical fluctuations are the things that are interpreted as creating Boltzmann brains. Mm -hmm. and in the last few years, he came out with a paper, which I am persuaded by, by saying that was just the wrong way to do the quantum calculation. The, the right way to do the quantum calculation does not allow the baby universes to show up or the Boltzmann brains. Uh, these fluctuations just don't exist. And so, in fact... Quantum fluctuations don't exist? Or what kind of quantum fluctuations? The kind of quantum fluctuations that could create either a Boltzmann brain or a baby universe. Really? So, hmm. That and with this, what's the name of this paper, you know? I don't remember. I could get you the link. Okay, no. okay. We'll do that later. But, but it, it, the idea is that um, people have looked at, you know, 
basically variation within a quantum vector as if that were fluctuations, whereas it's more plausibly just part of a vector that's a stable vector that is not fluctuating. So uh, you want to, when you think about physical processes and fluctuations, you have to ask whether uh, you are looking at a quantum state that has some multiple components, but the state is stable versus a quantum state that would actually move and change such that would, there would be actual fluctuations. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a tangent, perhaps, but, but you asked about Boltzmann. Yes, so I that's did. That's why I don't believe in Boltzmann brains very much, okay. because uh, it's connected to this how to do quantum calculations uh, paper about... Um, so, you know, I could imagine a universe where Boltzmann brains were a problem, and then, uh, then you'd have to do more of the things that people have been trying to do to make sense of them. Okay. But uh, I don't, in fact, think it's actually a problem because of that. Now, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Ones that like us. <laughs> Ones that like us. <laughs> but they won't kill us. They won't destroy they us. They won't kill us. Okay, so <laughs> number one, don't kill us. Okay, yeah. let's, let's suppose that there is a whole class of aliens that won't kill us. Among that class, what kind would you like? Well, uh, whatever we are proud of and like in ourselves, we'd like them to have too. That is, we'd like it not to matter so much whether we live or they live. We'd like them to be an adequate substitute for us. If, if if we are proud of our peacefulness or our art or music or whatever it is we are proud of in ourselves, if they have it too, then um, it's less important whether we win or they win if there's a conflict. Oh, well, you mentioned before about the priority of using things. So if I'm an alien and I'm going to use the Earth, I don't care about killing people. So. Uh, that would be a bad alien. To, would well, kill. we probably would have a similar attitude toward aliens. I know that. I know that. That's why it, we might. We might. On the other hand, people pretend to say, no, we're going to protect the aliens that we find. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe. Okay, so, for example, a lot of young men like the movie Avatar because they have sexy aliens. So sure, apparently you uh, have sexy no, no, with no. the aliens. And a lot of academics um, want the aliens to be wise so they can so answer the questions. I, an alien that is capable and smart could cooperate with us. So this is the key idea of cooperation again. Why would it want to cooperate with us? Because we might have things at once or threats that we could impose on it. So if we were able to, um, you know, offer it things either positive or negative, then we might be able to entice it to make deals with us, to make uh, okay. joint arrangements whereby we both get some of what we want and we don't destroy each other. Now you've seen the movie Contact, right? Yeah. At the end of the movie Contact, Jodie Foster a kid has asked Jodie Foster, you know, she, the kid says, are we alone? And she says, well, if there's nobody out there, it's an awful waste of space. Yeah. No, that seems that's like... It's about a, using, isn't it? That's well, about using things. <laughs> well, what do you think of that comment? Yeah, she's right. A big empty universe, it's kind of elegant, but you could have a much smaller version of it and it would still be pretty much just as elegant. A universe that big being empty is pretty much a waste. Now, when I heard that, I thought of Captain Cook coming to Australia, seeing yeah. uh, Terra Nullis. So they saw some hunter-gatherers and they said, hey, let's call it Terra Nullis, there's nobody here. So, okay. And so the idea was, hey, this is a waste of space because no one is European here. They're right. all sure. primitive. Yep. So do you subscribe to that? Would, I mean, is that what you think? You have to make an evaluation of different things and compare them in order to make choices. This is the essence of making choices. You can't make choices without comparing wait, the evaluation talk, of wait, things. Wait, so, you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe in free will, but go ahead. <laughs> Pret pretend if you're going to address that issue. Sure. <laughs> in a word of me, you have, to you have to imagine alternative arrangements of things and value them. You have to decide which ones are higher value than others. Now, the fact that sometimes in the past people have made evaluations that we don't embrace now does not reject the very idea of evaluation. You well, still must evaluate. But why would it be a waste of space if if there's no one like us in the rest of the universe. Why does that make it a waste? That seems to well, me it's just It's different. more about if there's a universe and it's not being used in a way that we value, then it's a waste. So if not it's being, being used in some way, then we have to ask how much do we value it? It's about valuing the use. Well, if, the, if a universe is being used but in a way that we don't value, it is a waste to us and we would rather replace it with a use that we value. That's what it means to value something. So if I think stars are really cool and they are users, then they are using the hydrogen in the universe and so it's not a waste of space. But if you think stars are really, I don't care about stars, exactly. therefore it's a waste of space. Yeah. So whether it is or is not a waste of space depends on our perspectives on what's going on out there. Depends on your values, yes. Values.
So there's no scientific objective answer to that that's independent well, we of values. We talk about scientific objective answers. We'll just say, if there is this general tendency toward competition, then if there is stuff that's not and being... And cooperation, and cooperation. Yeah. But if there's stuff that's not being used either in this in support of competition or cooperation, uh -huh. then it will it's get displaced used. by something else that does use it in that way. So we can predict a long-term tendency to use things in a way that support competitors who may be cooperating as well. Okay, that's interesting. Uh... So I can predict that if there's a bunch of empty stars and all they're being used is because some guy off in the corner looks at them and saying, I sure like stars. And if that guy in the corner can't support that opinion with enough competitive strength and cooperative uh, deals to offer, then it won't continue that way. Huh. That's, okay. that's being scientific and positive about it. That is just saying, not about what I want, that's just what I predict. It, it would be scientific if you didn't have the subjectivity of what you mean by a user. Because you seem to use that all the time. And for me, every time I, you use the word user, I say, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? And, you, and then you say, I'm talking about you, for example. And then I say, well, wait a minute, is a star user, is a you know, house user, is the Gaia user. And then all these questions come on my head, and then you go on as if it means should mean so, something objective. And I say, what? I don't know what you're talking about. You, you might like to read Sean Carroll's latest book, The Big Picture, which yeah, goes I, on about all these different ways of talking about things. But I do think um, I used to do physics, and I understand that in physics we have a certain set of solid concepts that we understand what they mean. And there are many other fields who use concepts which have not been rigorously reduced to physical concepts. Nevertheless, in fact, they are usually quite reasonable concepts. Um, a user is not a reason is, is not a biologically recognized. We talk about the unit of selection, but yes. that is a whole can of worms. Whether it's group selection or how big the unit of selection is in multiple units, etc. And this is the thing about genes or individuals or groups or even half a gene. And so sure. it's a can of worms. And so there's nothing you I can rely it a on. Can of worms. That's because you don't think so. You just aren't embracing the way biologists do things. So biologists, they get along with these concepts. They make do and they make progress. Similarly, economists make do with concepts like agents and preferences, uh, prices, uh, <coughs> cooperation. These yeah. are all concepts that we social scientists use, and we use them in sensible ways. And if we haven't reduced them to physical axioms, sorry, but they're still useful. <laughs> or, or they seem useful anyway. All right. How about this? Uh, will we recognize aliens if they come about? If there's a general tendency of aliens and us and whatever is live and not dead out there to compete and use resources and we will see them by the resources they use. At some point we will try to use a resource and they will use it instead. So look for their garbage. Look for the stuff you wanted to use that isn't there. Look for the things you're trying to use that they're in the way of. Yes. Look, look for the stuff that they have used. For example, say, yes. Like look for their exhaust. So I actually did a analysis of a, a colonization wave. Uh, you saw my talk yes. on a wave of colonization. Yes. And I said, if there had been a colonization wave so from some alien civilization, and it had once passed this way, mm -hmm. what would we look for now to see evidence of that? And the two pieces of evidence are, you look for missing resources. The wave came by this way. There was some resources that used them, and they're not there anymore. And the other is garbage. Whatever they turn the missing resources into, uh, whatever their process had as a side effect of creating that mm -hmm. things they couldn't be bothered to recycle and reclaim, mm -hmm. that garbage would be still around. Those are the two things to look for as evidence of aliens, missing resources and garbage. Okay, so when the French in Gabon found the isotopic anomalies that eventually led them to what was called a natural reactor, right? Uh, now, you could say, well, uh, a water stream full of uranium used that energy to heat up a local environment. Yep. But then you'd say, that's stupid. That's not. There's no user there. It's nature. And then I'm saying, well, aren't all users part of nature? Again, I'm not that vested in a binary concept here. I'm happy to think of a continuum of le levels of complexity of life and civilization. So I'm happy to notice, as many chemists have, that there are chemical processes that have a degree of complexity. That is, when you have a, a system of, say, uh, you know, a hot, a hot plate and a cold plate and fluids going between them, and you increase the temperature difference between those plates, the complexity of the fluid pattern in between increases. It increases in such a way so that it can more efficiently uh, transfer the heat from one side yeah. to the other. So that's a kind of complexity. It's not so it's life used, necessarily, it's but using it's using a temperature gradient. If you will. 
I don't I much care whether you what you call it. I well, want to you know keep on using you, using as if yes. it's a fundamental thing, and so I'm trying to under. If you don't no. care, then I'm going to call it a user, and then stars are using the hydrogen, so therefore there has been a wave of aliens pass through. And, and matter of fact, if you it, like. was, it was about uh, 13 billion of, years ago. It's a matter of the sophistication and complexity of the adaptation process of this user. So well, I, then you're using like four words that I have no idea about adap complexity. So one of the hard key one, right? points of life, as opposed to simple chemical processes that produce a physical effect and use a resource is the life adapts much more robustly to changing environments. That is, as the environment changes, the life can continue to have the same uh, path of, or, of or origin to descendants, uh, use the resources, whereas ordinary chemical and physical processes when the environment changes, the process will just end and it'll have to wait to restart in some other way. Well, stars rearrange themselves all the time as they burn through the nuclear fuel from hydrogen yes. to helium, helium to carbon, oxygen, etc. Right, but they are not adapting very well to those changes. The, so, well, they're doing exactly what they need to do in order to start burning the next thing. So why, why is that not adaption? I, if you disturbed a star in some dramatic way, it wouldn't necessarily have a way to adjust and, and, and adapt to that What are you talking about? You have a giant star, a giant planet as big as Jupiter, smashes into the thing, boop, 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 after a year it's adjusted back to where it wants to be. So it more efficiently uses the hydrogen, turns into helium. This is called the maximum entropy production principle. On Earth, if we have ordinary chemical processes that are using a resource in some sense, mm -hmm. and we have life, that's using a similar set of resources. And we have these two things compete with each other. Life tends to win. That is, the adap adaptive process, the processes that can change their processes to adapt to circumstances tend to win out over non-adaptive processes to get use of the resources. Well, it seems and to me that stars are winning out over the life forms on this planet because they're burning lots and lots and lots of hydrogen. Sure. We can't even burn, we can't even start fusion yet. But eventually, our descendants may hopefully go out to the stars and then we will beat the stars for those resources. We are complicated. Beat the stars. If we want the hydrogen in the stars, we will take it and the stars will no I longer use it the way we are. We can become part of a star. We can use stars. You could call it being part of the stars, but the point is the pattern of behavior of use of the star will mainly be determined by the descendant from us. They will have descended mm. from us and their habits will be descended from our habits. Because we are an adaptive species with an adaptive heritage, if we adapt to changing circumstances, we will create descendants who are also very adaptive, and that means they will win out in deciding which resources get used. How? Oh, okay, are you, are you an alien? Uh, I'm an alien to things from uh, other places, <laughs> certainly. Only when I leave the United States, right? <laughs> so um, you're not an alien. I'm not an alien to yeah. Earth. And I'm, I'm native to Earth. Are you visiting us from the future? Uh, no, uh, not visiting you from the future. Uh, uh, or should I believe you? If you were, you wouldn't tell me, would you? Why? Well, I think I would want to tell you. <laughs> I think if I could go back in time, I would brag about it. A bit. If I could get away, they wouldn't all kill me and hang me. Okay. Uh, but uh, sure, I, that, might be, that might be quite a thing to brag about, really. Maybe yes. if I wasn't even an alien from somewhere else, I might want to brag about it. I mean, mm -hmm. it is rather puzzling, this whole hypothesis of aliens from the future or elsewhere, visiting us secretly. So, what, you know, what, what do they get all about the secrecy? Why don't they just show themselves, take over? I mean, you know, we'd be really impressed. We'd, we'd do a lot of things for them if they only show up and ask. If they only show, <laughs> if they showed up and asked, wouldn't we just destroy them and say, hey, we're competing with well, you, we're going to kill you? We might cooperate. We might cooperate. Alien shows up, they could certainly show us a lot of reasons to cooperate with them. They would have technologies, abilities, knowledge that we wouldn't have. We would like those things. We might be willing to trade for them. Yeah, we would be worried whether we could trust them, whether we could set up a deal. That's part of the difficulty of cooperation. That's why cooperation is hard in part. It's because it's not just figuring out a deal. You have to figure out how to enforce the deal. Stephen Hawking is known for saying we should keep our head down when it comes to aliens. We should not broadcast our existence. Yeah, he's right. And uh, you think he's right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, in the movie Contact, besides the scene at the end, there's a scene where they first start hearing the signal. Yeah. And then Jodie Foster tries to explain this to the U.S. military. And then there's a kind of a semi-paranoid general that says, Oh yeah, they're gonna, what is this thing? If you build it, it's gonna, just gonna, uh, just gonna eat up the earth or destroy us and get us to kill ourselves. So it's a suicide so a blueprint. And Jerry Ostriker, I don't know, he's a cosmologist, uh, he says, he says, oh yeah, we shouldn't even listen. Not only shouldn't we send signals, we should not even listen because whatever those signals are, they are there as memes to convince us to kill ourselves. 
So that's a degree of paranoia that most people don't share. <laughs> yeah. How about you? That does seem a little extreme. For my taste, yes. <laughs> so you think we should listen? Yeah, I mean, we might listen cautiously. We might have several levels of direction. So you could have some guys in a room off in Alaska listening and, you know, let them listen for a month and then see if anything happens to them before uh, <laughs> send the message on to us. You could, you could be a little cautious without having to be, you know, completely off. So if you were in that room deciding with the military, you'd say, I understand where you're coming from, but let's uh, build it and uh, let's build part of it or something. Let's put some cautious protections in. That's, it's not just trusting all the way down the line, but uh, yeah, it would be too tempting not to have some part of us listen to some of it. Some uh, of it. All right. In the same movie, there's, a, I think, a religious fanatic who says, hey, you don't believe in God, you shouldn't go visit the aliens because you, to represent uh, America and the world, you have to be religious or believe in God. What did you think of that religious part that Carl put in that? I just find it hard to see things from religious points of view, so I can't really judge the accuracy of a religiously based argument if I don't understand it at an intuitive level. What's, what's but a lot of the world economy seems to me to be involved in, in religion. And I mean, I understand that religion is very beneficial for people. All the standard correlations are that people who are more religious are uh, more productive, happier, live longer, more friends, less crime, all the great things. So clearly we understand that religion is useful for people. It is useful for civilizations. It has been and it'll probably last. That's one of the reasons I think religion will last and even thrive in the age of them.